Thank you very much, all, all, all of you, for absolutely excellent contributions. And if, if you think I'm sitting a little awkwardly in the chair, it's because I'm very much sat on the fence in this, and I'm sure many of you are also in a, in a, in a similar frame of mind. I'm going to throw it straight open to questions now to, to, to the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, please put your hand up. I'm going to take them in groups of three. Okay, Amanda, the first one's over there. Then I'll take one from the chap in the second row. Good evening. Thank you. Um, John Vidal brought up uh, Germany during the uh, debate, and uh, you mentioned, John, that uh, uh, you, you said that Germany does, doesn't need uh, nuclear power. Well, if that's the case, why is Germany burning more coal power since uh, Fukushima, since they shut down the, their nuclear power stations? Uh, and also, you, you said that um, nuclear power is more expensive than all renewables. Well, I just looked it up on my phone. Um, there's been a lot of mention uh, about the uh, uh, strike price for uh, Hinkley Point in the last couple of days is £92.50 per megawatt hour. The uh, strike price for um, offshore wind is currently about uh, £120 per megawatt hour, so I, I thought I'd bring that up with you. Uh, and also, um, there was a lot of mention about uh, the safety of nuclear power. There's a really good article on uh, Forbes magazine called How Deadly Is Your Killer Watt? I recommend everybody reads it. What, what the article does, it takes all the, uh, the data about how many people died from each, uh, how, how, what the human cost is from each en uh, energy generation, and uh, it divides that by the, the total amount uh, of energy generated. And if, if you look at the, the actual data, nuclear actually comes out near the bottom. I mean, Chernobyl, uh, the World Health Organization have studied Chernobyl for uh, about 30 years now, and uh, the, the, the only evidence of, of death that they can find from Chernobyl is, 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 is less than actually about uh, a few hundred. I mean, the, 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 uh, the article in Forbes I, I mentioned, um, it, it says that more people have actually fallen off their roofs, fixing their solar panels and, and broken their necks and died <laughs> than, than Chernobyl. So, um, yeah, I just thought, uh, thank okay, you. Thank you. Ne ne next point, there was a chap in the second row here. You make your points brief so we can get as many as possible. Hello, and, uh, Steve Roman. My question is to Dr. Fiona Raymond. Um, could you address some of those safety issues that John referred to, the number of nuclear accidents, leaks, and things like that, please? Okay, that's one for you, Fiona, and the, the chap at the end. We, we do take questions from women as well. Just again to uh, John. Um, from as far as... Well, as far as I know, nobody actually died directly from wind-scale piles. How many people died from Piper Alpha? And also, if Germany doesn't need nuclear power, why are they buying it all from France, which, as far as I know, is also 80% nuclear, maybe? Maybe even 90? I don't know. They're very nuclear anyway. Okay, first of all, I'm going to ask uh, John, since you are the uh, target of the, of, the, of the question from the chat there. Coal and, and also the, 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 the fixed price of energy, he addressed that in your, in your points. Question in your figures, John. Well, I, I, I accept I'm going to be a lightning rod in this, um, this, this um, unbiased audience. But, um, um, okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to address the last point you made. It was a very interesting one about um, only a few people died at uh, Chernobyl. Um, I actually went to Chernobyl. I went around all the hospitals. I talked to all the radiological people. We, went, we, we spent days in Belarus, in uh, Ukraine itself. Um, and I can honestly, honestly say that as far as I can see, and from the published scientific literature, not the WHO stuff, which only accepted uh, scientific literature which was in English, not the Russian stuff, not the Belarusian stuff, not the Ukrainian stuff, only stuff which was written in English, as far as I can tell, very, very many more did, as up to maybe 10,000, 20,000, and the people, that's, that doesn't even include the people who went in there to try and douse those flames and whatever. It was a complete catastrophe. And the figures, because it, was, it all happened at the time of uh, uh, Russia breaking up, or the Soviet Union breaking up, uh, most of the records have gone. But from what I can see and what I understand is that uh, the people dispersed right the way through the whole Soviet Union, and they are still feeling it today. The number of cancers, the number of leukemias is absolutely extraordinary, the thyroids or whatever. So please don't ever insult the Belarusians and the Ukrainians by saying only a few of you died, because death was only the very end of a very, very horrible catastrophe, health catastrophe, which will last for generations. We know that for a fact. 
Um, number two, Germany, yes, it's using a bit more coal now, sure, but it has got a plan. It has got a vision which it gets, it will get to the energy we end, or I, I don't know, I'm not a German speaker, um, will, you know, is, is, is on target to get to a point where it does not need coal and it does not need uh, nuclear, and it is, uh, what's the word, is investing billions, billions, I mean, un unimaginable amounts of money. The same kind of money which we put into nuclear, they're putting into renewable energy. They're on target. And it's very interesting. Nobody knows the answer whether they're going to get there. I accept that completely. And you may be right. Now, when it comes to um, you know, strike rates of uh, nuclear in 60 years' time and uh, offshore wind today, well, y you may well be right. I mean, it, this, is, these, this is all guesswork. This is, frankly, this is guesswork. Um, there is no uh, history of anyone having to try and work out what the price of anything is going to be in 60 years' time. So I can say, but, you know, basically say that it's... Uh, it, 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 it's, uh, offshore wind doesn't actually make much sense in many, many ways. Uh, I, can, I can accept that. Um, but, uh, but I think if you look at the trajectory, then renewable energies are all coming down. You cannot deny that. And nuclear energy is going up, as we've seen very clearly with Hinkley. That was so, such an obvious point. Sorry, I won't go on. <laughs> well, thank, thank you very much, John. I have lots of opportunities to address these questions. Fiona, the chap in the second row, had a, a question very much directed at you about the safety issues of the nuclear industry. And I, I'll ask Francis to come in uh, after you as well, Fiona. Steve, thanks for that question. Um, just in relation to, um, I mean, first of all, no accident is good, um, whether it be in nuclear, whether it be in any other industry for that matter. And we've had, we've had a number of catastrophes over the, over the years um, in various other industries too. And I think we need to take that into context. Um, we've had issues with oil. We've had issues um, on a number of different fronts in terms of what's been happening with miners within various aspects of the coal industry. Um, if you take and an example, uh, absolutely. I mean, if you yeah. absolutely, so completely, completely um, agree with that. If you take um, Fukushima as an example, um, that was an absolutely terrible um, disaster in terms of what actually happened out there. Um, when you think about the fact that there was a, a massive earthquake and a tsunami that completely and utterly devastated an, an entire region within Japan. Um, it actually devastated more than just um, the, the, people, the people who were living in their, their homes there. It also devastated a lot of the industry surrounding that area. It devastated the fishing industry. It devastated, um, there was a number of oil um, refineries that were there that were completely and utterly annihilated. Um, Looking at what happened with Fukushima, um, yes, there was um, some. Um, there was a, a couple of explosions that actually happened within the um, Fukushima Daiichi reactor itself um, due to uh, hydrogen release, um, and that that was contained um, within a particular area. When you actually start to look at deaths that were actually um, generated associated with Fukushima, um, well, the answer is that there's been there's been none so far. And there was and one if, that you today, so it hasn't quite been proven yet that that was specifically in relation. It hasn't quite been proven yet that that was in relation to um, Fukushima itself, and we need to wait and see what what actually happens as a result of that. Um, there was actually some statistics that were actually put out there in terms of actually people um, within the area who were outside of that containment zone, um, whether they actually had any risk to their health. Um, and basically, the answer was that if you actually ate a lot of bananas in a year, you would actually have more issues with your health in comparison to sitting somewhere just outside of that containment zone. So, um, need to take all that into account. The other thing I would actually say is that in terms of the UK, we actually have a rather good regulatory authority. Now, I mean, with any sort of industry, you need to have the right level of regulation. Safety is of utmost importance, and therefore you actually need to regulate that safety in a way that it's actually it's understood. Everybody understands exactly where the issues could come in, and you actually have every single risk absolutely mitigated in terms of taking that forward. Um, now, our regulatory regime in the UK, which is actually run by the, the Office of Nuclear Regulation, is highly regarded throughout the world. And the International Atomic Energy Authority actually sees the UK regulatory authority as one of the best, if not the best, in the world. Um, and it's not, a, it's not a coincidence, actually, that the Chinese are actually coming to the UK and actually wanting to build a Chinese reactor, potentially, here 
uh, or at least invest in, 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 in one of the reactor systems at the moment um, in the UK. It's, the, it's not a coincidence. It's because of the fact that we actually have such a good regulatory regime that they actually want to be in a situation that they actually have that regulatory stamp going forward. So I actually think that no, no, no accident's good. We shouldn't rest in our laurels. We should ensure that these things do not happen. Um, that's why we have the sort of regulatory authority that we have in the UK to monitor that. And that's also why we have an International Atomic Energy Authority that actually goes in and shuts things down very quickly should these things happen um, in the future. Lovely. Thank you, Fiona. Fra Francis, did you want to just come back quick. on any of the, the, the I, points I think, on I, safety? I just, in I mean, well, a number of times, Ch Chernobyl's been mentioned a number of times, and the, I suppose the, the human impact is, is something that's very contentious. There are, there are some people who say it's pretty small and there are some people who say it has been catastrophically huge. And th this is a debate that's been running for 30 years. Uh, I, I think one of the most authoritative people in this area is actually Jerry Thomas from Imperial College in London, who has done an awful lot of work over some decades and I would simply commend what she has done to those who, who wish to find out. Uh, she's, a, she's far more expert in this, I suspect, than, than any of us sitting here. Uh, but she's a very good source of this information. Okay. Uh, right, let's, to, let's move to a, a next group of questions. If, if, you, if you could indeed, um, we've, got, we've got one right down here in the front, Amanda, but I notice you've got what one at the back? We will come to you next. No one's really spoke about the waste that gets produced from nuclear power stations. And obviously, as they grow, where is it all going to go? Very, a very good question on, on waste. Yeah, and then finally, the, the chap on the back row. I think that the nuclear advocates are somewhat ignoring the arc of history. Over the past 2,000 years, there are now very, very well verified, verified records of huge human catastrophes, sometimes produced by mere volcanic explosions which destroy agriculture. They're supposing that we're going to have in the next 2,000 years a stable human society which can in fact manage all these nuclear power stations. Surely it is entirely possible that non-nuclear, entirely human catastrophes can take place depriving those nuclear power stations of the very staff which is needed for their safe operation. What do they have to say, please? Okay, thank you very much. We've had, um, <coughs> I'll, I'll let Francis come back first of all on the, the point on waste and, um, and also Fiona, if you want to come back on, on, on the point about hu the potential for the uh, human catastrophe and, and the, the arc of history. Okay. Yeah. Francis. Right, um, okay. I. I I should confess that I, I'm a member of government's advisory committee on radioactive waste management, so I, I am, if you'll pardon the expression, immersed in radioactive waste. Um, <laughs> right, uh, I think there are a number of things. Um, first of all, in terms of volumes and types of waste, the inventory we have is pretty well understood. We know what we've got, we know what's in it, and we have technologies for immobilizing it, storing it, and governments made a clear policy decision uh, seven years ago that geological disposal for the higher activity components of that waste was the right thing to do. Um, so there is a very clear life story for the UK's existing waste. I would pick up the point that was made earlier by the last speaker that there is a very different set of questions around new build waste and our committee made that point very clearly to government in the 2007 report we produced because you have the choice over whether or not you produce that waste. The, the legacy exists or will exist and we have to deal with it. New build waste doesn't exist and you, you could choose never to create it. So we saw the two as very separate and I think we still do. Nevertheless, if government chooses to go down a path of new nuclear and chooses to create the wastes associated with that, then the technology around dealing with it is actually no different from dealing with the, the existing legacy. There's just more of the same. And in terms of total volumes, you know, to, to dig a geological disposal facility, to put the waste down there and to seal it up, it is 
a long project, and it's a fairly, a fairly expensive project by the standards of these things, but it is all technically achievable. So I think there is, it is clear that there is a technical solution to waste. There are big problems around the public acceptability of that solution uh, and how you actually make it happen, and that's what government is wrestling with at the moment. Uh, and the other, I would, this does relate to the last point on institutional control. It is probably not right to create waste and then leave it in a shed somewhere for thousands of years. I mean, regardless of how much you think you might be able to control it, it is still a burden on future generations. And the ethical argument about creating waste and disposing of it over a time scale of decades to centuries is actually a very powerful driver because it means you don't impose a burden on future generations. And that is a, that's a strong argument for actually dealing with the problem and not leaving it sitting in a shed for your children, your grandchildren, or beyond. Thanks. Okay. Grace, did you want, did you want to come back? Particularly, um, I, thought, I thought there was a, a couple of issues there. We've actually had a tweet in from Jamie Reid, MP, former oh. head of communications at... Um, um, at Sellafield, who's now uh, an, an MP, who resigned on the day of Jeremy Corbyn's uh, ele election over Labour's potential nuclear stance. Interestingly, relating to the point about um, the, the, the wilding and, and the, the threats to human civilization, I notice his avatar is now Rick Grimes from The Walking Dead. I don't quite know what that says about nuclear uh, confidence in the future. Grace. Uh, well, just, uh, I just wanted to follow up on the, the issue about uh, the, the, the waste legacy uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to know how much you've got and, and that you've, you've, you, you know what you've put it in. It's, it's then a question of where you're going to put it. Um, and, and, and also, actually, um, it's one thing to know how much you're going to be charging for your electricity from, your, from new nuclear build, but how you're going to be paying in 60 years' time. Uh, how are you going to be paying for, for the, the, the disposal of, of, new, of uh, radioactive waste at that point? And, um, yeah, I... I believe that we should, I, I, under, I do take your point that they're two separate issues, but I, I think we should deal with one before we, before we start looking to the other one. Yeah, John? The committee said the same, actually. Jolly good. <laughs> You've got the technology, you haven't got the geology, and you haven't got the money. I mean, that's, it's, it's, we've been... We've been geology, I'm not having that. Well, the, okay, well then... <laughs> so yeah. he knows exactly where the... He knows where it's going to go. No he way. knows... Where's, where's the money going to come from? How are you going to persuade these communities? Are you going to bribe them? Nobody wants this stuff. Nobody in the world wants this stuff. You can take it to Australia, take it anywhere you want. Nobody wants it. Why would volunteer if nobody wanted it? Why haven't you dealt with it already if you know so much? I mean, the answer is it's been sitting around for 50 years. It's getting worse and worse by the day. And it's just not being a done. It's costing, what, 80 billion is appar apparently the bill at the moment look ahead another 20 years, 200 billion, 300, I don't know, make up the figure. It's really, this is a nonsense. No government, no political government wants to get involved in this because it's going to tie up the decommissioning bill for the next 100 years. I mean, they, they're absolutely in a fix about this. They don't know what to do. They hate, they hate the whole idea of it. They want to brush it under the carpet. Um, uh, the, the, the man who talked about the catastrophe uh, was very, I mean, it's, it's absolutely right. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of years. We're not talking about tomorrow or, or t you know, a, a couple of months' time. It, this, is, this is forever. We must assume this is forever. And, and until we understand that existential problem, we're not going to get anywhere near the answer. The only answer, the only moral answer, the only economic answer is stop doing it. If you're digging a hole, and you, I mean, just stop digging. It's madness at the moment. Um, you know, we can't deal with what we've got. How we can deal with a vast increase, a vast nuclear renaissance, I have no idea whatever. Okay. Um, Francis, are, are the next generation of, of, of nuclear power stations going to be generating the same amount of waste, the £70 billion pound cleanup bill that we're currently having to, to, to deal with? Uh, in a word, no, because we are dealing with the legacy of a defence programme, of a range of experimental programmes, and of a large civil <coughs> nuclear power programme. So there is a substantial legacy which has to be dealt with, uh, and I think everyone accepts that. What I would take issue with is that government is ducking the issue. I would say governments historically have ducked the issue, mm -hmm. 
but I would, I would go back to the 2002 white paper, the UK nuclear legacy, managing the nuclear legacy, a strategy for action, which was government finally saying, it is not acceptable to carry on as we have, we have to do something. And that led to a fundamental rethink about civil nuclear power in this country and a commitment from government to start to deal with the problems we had been left by our grandfathers and our fathers. So I think to say government is doing nothing is unfair on government, and I am rarely fair to government. <laughs> uh, I fully accept the different issues around con new nuclear, and that is a different debate. I've said that already, and that remains my view. C okay. Can I also just, 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 just say that um, in terms of the different generation of reactor systems that we've had in the UK, Going back to the first generation, which was back in the, the 1960s, yes, there was a lot of waste that was, di that was actually um, basically made at that time based on operations. It was still a very small um, amount of waste in comparison to the sort of waste you see in other systems, less than 3% of what the overall um, volume of everything else that was actually being um, dealt with at the time. In addition to that, actually looking to the current generation of reactor systems that are now going to be built, um, their waste footprint is around a tenth of the, the old reactor systems that we're talking about. And that's because there is learning that has happened throughout the decades in terms of how you build systems and how you actually plan for decommissioning at the design phase. And that's exactly what's happening now today. Okay, thank you very much, all of you. What an excellent array of speakers. Francis Livens, Fiona Raymond, Grace Fletcher Hackwood, and John Vidal. Thank you, all of you in the audience. Could you please show your appreciation? You will have your opportunity. There will be feedback forms handed to you as you leave the event tonight uh, for the Science Festival. Um, please mention that you thought that the, the discussed debate was uh, the great highlight of the Science Festival this year, and hopefully we can repeat the exercise and have a debate in next year's festival. But to tell you about our future debates and to reveal the result of tonight's debate, I'd like to very warmly welcome my colleague Mike Emmerich to the podium. Thank you, Michael. Um, so, you want to know the results, so I'll tell you all the other stuff first. Um, we usually hold these debates on a Thursday night, once a month. Um, not here, but in the Manchester Central Library. I can see a lot of faces here I haven't seen at Central Library. So have a look at uh, www.discuss.org.uk and you'll find details of our debate on the 12th of November, the motion for which is Education is Failing Our Economy. Uh, and on the 3rd of December, where we're discussing whether or not gambling is out of control. And my suggestion for next year's science debate, because um, uh, this, is, this is a special we do, this is free, but I have to say the other one's very small charge, to consider it a pint or two, it's not much. Uh, but these, these are debates we do as part of the science uh, festival. And uh, I want to do next year with everyone in, uh, with mutton chop whiskers and 19th century, if not 18th century clothing on coal, no thanks. <laughs> because I suspect we'd find remarkable similarities uh, from what we've heard tonight. But it's a great debate. It's been absolutely fantastic. So to the, to, to the oh, what, one more thing before we get to what you really want to hear. Can we thank our excellent chair for this evening, Michael Taylor. <laughs> That's a big applause. Um, he didn't deserve it. No, he, yes, he did. Um, we do this, Michael, Martin and I and everybody involved, out of the love of it because uh, we think this city deserves a higher standard of debate and tonight's has proven uh, that it, you can do it in this city and we're going to carry on doing it because we really believe in it and we think it's worth it. Um, and tonight does prove that in the result because when you came in, we did a straw poll and if you recall, 55% of you were in favour of the motion, 12% of you were against and 33% of you were undecided. There has been a very large shift in the numbers. And v most of those who have gone from being undecided have gone to being against the motion. The final result is that 61.5% are in favour of the motion. 38.5% are against, so the motion is carried. But congratulations especially to the no's and another round of applause to everyone involved. Thank you.